Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about doing an autopsy on this two-stroke outboard that was run without oil in the fuel and is proudly sponsored by marineengine.com. It's been a couple of weeks since uh, I've done a video. Sorry about that, long story. Uh, Started pulling this engine apart quite a while ago, but now it's time to get in, split this crankcase open and see what's happened. Before we do that though, let's go back in time to when Lorenzo and I pulled the power head off the outboard. Lorenzo and I are back. Guys, <laughs> welcome back to the Riva. His job's to do the young people thing. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Yeah, yeah, my job's to do the old man thing. Um, we're going to take this as the two-stroke. It has died. It's got some bearings have failed or something. But we're going to do an autopsy. There's no real money to repair it properly. We're going to pull it apart, see how bad the damage is. Maybe we'll repair it anyway. Who knows? These bottom bolts are pretty much at just under the waterline. So we'll block those up again once we've got the outboard off. Alright, go. See how high it is when it comes up. If the leg's too long, about stop out there. Now you just make it. It's always just these last couple that are down below the lower cowling that are a little bit more painful to get to. Yeah. You could always extract the bottom uh, spark plug just to make it a bit easier. Yeah, true. But we're not in that kind of game. No, we don't like make life easy for yourself. No, yeah. no. Boring. What's harder, finding the right spark plug socket? <laughs> Plus, they'll be the handles we'll use to lift the head. <laughs> Let's see what we see. Got any more? Got a spot over here. Oh. Try and angle it out. There, there we go. go. Nice. Okay, there's a little bit of gasket. Water's definitely got between the gasket. Nice. Okay. Gaskets were rooted. Oh yeah. Um, see, it doesn't look that bad. I'm thinking. What's, oh no, that's metal. I think. Is it? We scraped the pit. The no, rings? no. I think it's just bits of bearing. I mean, there's a little bit of dings from the bearing material. Yeah. Give it a nice Is polish. It? Could be nice. Yeah, we got a bit of yeah bearing. A bit of dinging. Crap yeah. There. But, but you it's know, not tremendous. No. Check the head for flat. Mm. I don't want to sit in here too long. Um, so I reckon I might quickly just zap the power head off mm -hmm. then I can take that home and then uh, we can just put the leg and everything somewhere safe and then uh, maybe get it back together. Cool. Um, You're going to do the leg? Well the power head goes up into here so we'll undo these bottom bolts and then uh, gear selector which we'll leave behind Just that um, oh, the drive bolt, whatever you call it, at the front. The the silver one, uh, the gold. Yeah, gold one. Uh, the square thing going across. Mm. So that's just a gear selector. It is not a gear selector. And I don't think it's attached to the outboard anyway. It's attached to the lower cowling, which is fine. What about the drive shaft that comes out of this thing? Does that slide straight up and out too? Uh, it, no, it's attached to the gearbox at the moment. Uh, but that's okay. Power head should come independently. I think we're pretty free. Uh, I think that gear selector was just onto a bracket. I think after that. Yeah, it's looking pretty clear on the right. Jeez. Clear on the left. Hmm. 
All right, let's get this out from back over here a bit more. Mm -hmm. Wandering. There we go. Decapitation. Got it. Fatality. Uh, all right. Is she looking at me? Oh, yeah, fuel line, of course. That's all right. Disconnect that one. Actually, I'll take it from here because that could be handy for testing. I reckon get the gurney. Mm -hmm. Gurney our boats, gurney that. Get that home. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Okay, let's get the gearbox off this outboard so it's lighter to take the bits up to the house. To do that, we're gonna to have to undo the bolts that are mm, here and mm, here somewhere. Let's just undo this gear selector linkage. Should be the last thing we need to do to get this gearbox off, other than find a way of lifting the rest of the outboard up. See if we can get it to drop down. Looks like the old uh, grease nipple must have uh, died, so they've uh, drilled and tapped it out using an angle grinder and then put a mild steel one in. There we go. Probably needs some type of. Uh, Water pump service, maybe, maybe not. Oh, little crab. Sorry, dude. Messed with your home. Oh, it stinks of high point oil. Must have leaking seals. All right. At least we can carry it in two bits now. Can't find the puller I normally use for this. Haven't done it in years. Let's just make one. It's probably easier. I think this might be big enough. Just, it's probably only gonna bend, but we'll give it a shot. All right, I'm gonna cut a chunk off this. All right, putting it in the vise didn't go so well. Doesn't really matter that the vice broke because I don't have an angle grinder with a cutting disc here anyway. Or the saws all and the plasma cutter's not working. So I'm gonna have a crack using a three-jaw puller, which in no known universe is the right way to do this job. But if we were to make a puller, all we're doing is getting something like this, high tensile bolt. Get the nuts, probably use two even, put them together so the threads are lined, put that on the bench grinder, turn it into a point. Make sure you don't wear glasses, that way you might get a week off work. That way the tip stays centered in this little depression on the top of the crankshaft. All right, I take it back, I did find a grinding disc.
So you take your perfectly square piece of metal, then we need to transfer these three holes into here and a large center hole as well, so the four holes all up. I'm going to get a bit of cardboard, make a template for these holes, given that the hole I've drilled is not big enough to go over here. Big enough for the bolt to go through, but not big enough to sit flush on the flywheel. There's our puller. Nah, let's make a steel one. It'll be better. All right, let's drill those. All right, I'm gonna need some bolts for this. Uh, Puller. We may as well use Yamaha bolts. So let's show you a bit more about the head. So this is the head of the two-stroke. No valves, obviously. It's got ports, which you'll see later. Do I own a 3 8 wrench? I don't even know if I own one. Do I? I do, but it's on the boat. Ugh, blood. Uh, okay, so thermostat cover. These are the actual head bolts. A little bit long for our purpose. But we'll see, these look about, about right, I think. Ew, smaller, aren't they? Not surprisingly. That's all right, we'll use the head bolts. So, while we're here, we'll have a little look under the head, because I'm pilfering bolts for the puller. These are too small, but this is where the thermostat lives. And you'll see the water jackets here. I've actually got a separate vid just on uh, outboard cooling. You'll also notice that on a uh, outboard, the gasket is wider than the lip that the thermostat sits in. So you can put the thermostat in after the gasket. So this covers the water jacket cover. Temperature sensor here. Some outboards actually don't have a cylinder head. They just have a water jacket cover. Pistons go in from the back and there's no looking at the uh, top of them other than through the spark plug hole. A little bit of a lip in here, let's pry it open. Oh, yeah. It doesn't come past the spark plugs. Yes, just. So, water jackets. Water jacket gasket. Cylinder head, head gasket. Oh, it's going to take two hands to get that off. There we go. So this bit's just the cylinder head. This bit, water jacket cover. Water comes in, comes up. When the back of the thermostat gets hot enough, it opens and water can travel and flow and then water flows around the outside of the pistons around here too and this here that looks like a big blob particularly when you don't have any glasses left is an internal anode got our bolt with two nuts roughly in the middle so it's not touching anywhere and uh, it's just welded in place All right, I'm gonna tack the two nuts to each other. Okay, let's let that cool down for a little bit. While that weld cools, let's uh, take this cover off. So, exhaust cover, cooling water, comes out of here. That's just your telltale. 
only a really small percentage of the cooling water comes out the telltale. The rest goes down the exhaust and comes out the prop, the middle of the prop. All right, muddy water. Still a bit warm, but that's all right. We'll make it work. All right, I'm just gonna use one, one nut and a washer as a spacer on each bolt. I was thinking I'd need more, but apparently not. So we're trying to get this in pretty even and flat, so we get a straight pull. Oh man, this ratchet's going in the bin, I hate it. Which is actually easier if all your bolts are the same, because you can see where the shank starts, but mine is what it is. This one needs to go more. You want enough thread in so you don't strip the thread, but on some of them, if you go too far, you will hit the coils, the lighting coil, the ignition coil, damage the outer shielding, cause a short, bad news. So, in enough, but not too much. I know that's not very helpful, but that's what it is. These three bolts are tight against the plate and the pressure of this center bolt. They're into the flywheel. The idea now is that we wind this bolt in and the plate pulls the flywheel up off the crankshaft here. This plate is probably too thin to do this successfully, but it's all I had. At least it gives you an idea. We could have welded a couple together maybe, but is what it is. Anyway, let's give it a shot, see if we win or lose. Place your bets. The other thing you need to do is stop your flywheel rotating. Uh, there are tools you can put in the flywheel, like a face spanner. I'm just gonna wedge this pry bar between the heads of the bolts, otherwise the whole thing just spins and nothing happens. Let's try the rattle gun. There we go. We had a win. It's a miracle. So, homemade puller. What I was saying before is make sure your bolts here don't come through and start gouging your coils here. These are another reason why it's, you can use heat on a flywheel, but you don't want to melt the insulation on here, once again, causing a short. All right, let's get this plate off. Here's the advance for the ignition timing. I've got a video on how that works, the basic principles anyway, in my video on setting the timing on a Tatsu outboard. But the beginning of that video is basically the theory behind ignition timing, if you're interested. These two wires come over to the choke solenoid. Let's take the whole carburetor off. This is turning into let's explore an outboard, isn't it? Wasn't meant to be, sorry. All right, that's the whole carburetor off with the uh, choke solenoid there. Fuel pump, fuel filter. Let's take this off. Two bolt holes, then a little hole here into the crankcase where it gets the vacuum pulses that drive the fuel pump. On this side, we've got the regulator rectifier. It takes AC from the coils, turns it into DC, well, half wave DC anyway and limits the voltage to, I don't know, 14, 15 for charging the battery. There's a fuse under the cover here that often sends power to the forward control. Then when you turn the key, that small amount of current comes through to the starter solenoid and cranks the motor. If this fuse is blown, you turn the key there's no power getting to the key, which means no power comes to starter solenoid, which means no power comes to starter. So that's something to check if you've got a no crank problem. Then, little CDI unit. CDI is your ignition, capacitive discharge ignition. So charges up capacitor, 
fires it to your coils, your coils then when the current stops the coil field collapses and a very high voltage goes to your spark plugs. Coils like this, one wire goes to the CDI and uh, that needs to be the right connection for the firing order. Obviously has to go to the right cylinder and then a ground. And that's pretty much it. Pretty straightforward. Good spares to carry. The reason I took this off is because we are taking the uh, coil plate off. So we have a connector here and one here. So that's our little CDI unit. They always look like this on the back. They look funny. Looks like gravel set into epoxy or something. That's normal. People freak out about it when they see it. So here we go. All right, so that's the wiring that went to the CDI unit. That's fine. This here is two green wires. So we know that's our AC lighting coil or our power coil. And it's earth down here. So lighting coil, ignition coil, and this linkage here is the ignition advance linkage. There we go, nice and easy. So, coils. Top main bearing. And this is the parting line here for the crankcase that we're looking to separate. But first, let's take this off, which will let us see the reeds, which are very critical to a uh, two-stroke outboard working. In this case, single carburetor feeding both cylinders. Just got our throttle mechanism here. We can get that out of the way. These are the two solenoid slash relays for the trim tilt. This was the start solenoid relay. All right, um, you know, let's just leave it attached to the solenoid. Just get the solenoid's earth off. All right, solenoid's off. Unplug these. Blue and green wires go to your trim tilt switch. One way's up, other way's down. All right, let's pop these hoses off, then we'll get this cover off and uh, show you the reed valves. So, here are the nice rusty reed valves. These are the stops that stop them opening too far. And let's see if we can get the plate separated. There we go. So, these need to close completely. And when they open, they open because the vacuum sucks them open and the vacuum's created by the piston going up. So with an outboard like this, you've got essentially four separate compartments. The crankcase half for cylinders one and two and the combustion chamber for cylinder one and two. As this piston goes up, i.e. turn it, it's coming up like this. It's creating a larger space in here than there was before that draws air into the crankcase and it draws fuel with oil in it from the carburetor. It comes in and as it draws it in, it opens the reed valves, the fuel and air comes in. Then when it starts to come back down, the reed valves close. They're, they're just a one-way valve, that's all. That's their only job, you know. Then that air and fuel mixture gets pushed instead of coming back out the carburetor which, you know, if you have bad reed valves, you will. You'll see fuel spitting back out the carburetor. Classic sign of bad reed valves. But if they're working, they block off. Then this air and fuel mixture will go through a port up the side. And I'll show you inside. When the piston gets low enough in its travel, that air and fuel mixture that's getting compressed in the crankcase gets pushed up into the combustion chamber and the exhaust flows out. That's why it's not very efficient because 
you know it's not a completely clean burn some unburnt fuel can go out the exhaust and there isn't completely fresh air inside so you have exhaust ports and intake ports and obviously the relative heights of those ports is what gives you the timing as opposed to valves on a four stroke this of course is completely different to the two stroke detroit diesel i have in my boat in that case you've got a supercharger a blower it's not actually supercharging but a blower that pushes fresh air into the cylinders and exhaust valves that are run off a camshaft to let the exhaust out very very different cleaner than this style of two-stroke all right where were we all right so yes reed valves replaceable uh you know you shouldn't be able to see light if you're looking at them and then you can see a bit of light you know through it like that you know it's no good all right where are we at let's get this bracket off here too with the uh final coil and the regulator rectifier on it On the bottom of the block, this is the bottom of the crankshaft where the drive shaft going down to the gearbox goes in, then exhaust and the cooling water comes out and another anode there. So, we're getting to the crunch. Let's undo this back half of the crankcase, get this up. Presuming the camera focuses better than my eyes do without glasses. You can see here, you've got rings like you have on a piston. They see all the compartments from each other. This is the plate that our coils went on. You can see in here, there's an oil seal that runs around here. Let's lift the whole kit and caboodle out. So I might spray a bit of WD into the pistons just to lubricate them a little bit. dual oil seals inside there. So the non-rotating part has the o-ring here, the rotating part has the oil seals. There is an oil seal puller on the boat but let's just use a pry bar because we're hacks. Oh, there we go. So typical oil seal, double oil seal here. So this bottom main bearing doesn't look too bad, you know, it's got a few bits of metal falling out of it, but it's pretty good, I reckon. But, I've got to say, if that's our only failure, that's about the only one on here that's easy to replace. So, pistons, crankshaft, bearings. So, there's our bores with the ports. This is the port that connects the crankcase to the combustion chamber. So if I spray WD down there, you can see it comes out the bottom. And that's how the fuel and air gets into the combustion chamber. When the piston is low enough to expose that port. You can see the top of the piston, the crowns, dinged by bearing material. All those bits and bobs have actually made their way through the port into the combustion chamber hit the top of the piston, out the exhaust. All right, let's see if we can press this bearing off and assess the other bearings. Here's our uh, bearing separator. Let's see if we can get this on tight enough. There's not much of a gap under it, to be honest. But we'll make it work somehow. I don't have a press here at all either, so you have to do it the old-fashioned way. I can't find the rest of this kit, you know. I don't know why I can't find anything in this workshop. It's quite clean. Hmm. There's a two hook. Do I have the hooks? I'm guessing it's Imperial, half inch UNC maybe. This is 12 mil, 1.25, that's close. Do I have any Imperial bolts? I don't think so. Okay, 
extension. I'm sure there's a number you can call to report tool abuse. Because that's about as dodgy as it gets. All right, let's just put a couple of cable ties around it. Stop it popping apart. One through each hole. Do even I want to put safety glasses on for this catastrophe? Probably would if I owned any. Don't think I do. Oh, this will do. Make some safety glasses. Nothing you can't do with an old screw packet. I think that looks all right. Let's give it a whirl. Nice. For the win. All right, so completely catastrophically failed bottom main bearing, but very, very easy one to replace, which is good. Uh, let's go out in the light. I seriously don't even have reading glasses. So I can't, oh, what are you two doing there? Oh, you're eating. <laughs> I picked a bit of metal up before. They must have found all the, uh, all the bugs underneath it. Little end bearings are easy to change, but they seem all right. Big end bearings feel very good, apart from the fact that I've now filled it with dirt. So all the Conrod bearings feel all right. This is my clean workspace for rebuilds. This one feels fine. It's easy to replace, so you probably would. And then these center bearings, hasn't failed like the other one, but it doesn't sound great, and I don't expect it to have that slop in it. Hmm. The issue is, you need to separate the crankshaft to press a new one on. Well, I wouldn't even say press on, this feels like it slides on. Uh, and then you need to clock it again. There's no play this way, they're in the right position, as in, you know, the timing's right. Basically, your cinnamon V blocks, you need a couple of dial gauges, all that kind of stuff, and it is quite a tricky process. Some of them, though, there actually isn't even anywhere to press. You know, there's nowhere to get that bearing separator in and press it out. Apparently, a lot of the time, they're sold as a unit, crank with bearings on it. That's the part you buy, which is a shame. The Evan Reed we worked on, these bearings, I think what they actually do is they freeze them, snap freeze them, and break them. So they've got a jagged join, but it means they go back exactly the same. And that's how you can put it together without separating the uh, crankshaft, which is kind of cool. So I'm thinking, no issue with the roller bearings, but I can't quite see in there. Mm. I might get a torch. They look like maybe ball bearings, which may explain why it rocks and rolls on the shaft a little bit. Ooh, hang on, is that a passing line there? Maybe it is. All right, uh, I don't have any glasses. Let's continue this project when my glasses turn up in the mail. All right, I'm going to see if I can find somewhere a little bit dirtier to leave this, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Anyway, I'll leave those things there so I know how it goes back together. At least my puller worked. Oh, another point about these pullers. Uh, you know, people make these all the time. But uh, if you've got multiple outboards you're working on, you can always just drill another set of holes in the plate and go, right, oh, these ones are for a 30 Yamaha. You know, these ones are for a 6 horsepower Mercury or whatever and have one plate that works for multiple outboards. 
So that's kind of cool about them. Meanwhile, while uh, daydreaming about being somewhere else entirely different, I uh, started thinking, I was rubbing my two brain cells together and realizing that this bottom bearing most likely failed because this outboard sank shortly before it also got run without oil. Being the bottom bearing, the water will have got into the crankcase, sat in the crankcase, and the salt water would have sat around that bottom bearing. So it gives me confidence that perhaps the other bearings aren't that bad. They would have got briefly had salt water, briefly run without oil, but the engine would have seized because the pistons heated up and seized in the bore rather than bearing failure. So I think this may be the only one we need to change. What this essentially means is we can probably just buy this bottom main bearing, new gaskets, some anodes, that kind of stuff, and get this outboard running again. Uh, time's a problem, but uh, I definitely think it's possible. I'm also curious as an experiment in some ways to see how cheaply we can do it. You know, give the bores a really light hone, clean up any burrs on the pistons, uh, flatten the head again, we'll check it for flat, sand it a little bit, put the feeler gauges under it, make sure it's flat, put it back together, you know, without going bonkers with the machining and all that kind of stuff. I'll keep you posted on that one. A um, little bit pressed for time at the moment because the plan is to take Renko up to Bundaberg to see uh, Damien and Jess up there. Uh, also gonna be swinging by the Sanctuary Cove boat show on the way. So I've got a lot to do on Renko that I've been working on uh, and I've got to sort of, you know, get that all ready in order to give myself maybe a good four weeks to get to the boat show in May, which means leaving in about four weeks. So it's all getting pretty tight. Uh, once again, sorry for the delay with this video. Huge thanks to people's patience, uh, particularly uh, marineengine.com and the patrons, because, um, you know, I know you guys really directly support me producing these videos and I've sort of let you down a little bit there. Uh, but I think we're getting back on track. And in other big news, Sleazy finally has a blue slip, which means it's officially roadworthy now. Thanks to a big push Mike did, uh, I went and picked up a new bonnet and a door, and Mike busted a gut and got those sanded, painted and everything and on. And uh, she's now done. So I'll put a link to a video that uh, Mike's doing on that soon, but next job is Rego. Job after that is going out to a dirt track and getting this thing sideways. I'm really glad that car project's across the line because I don't have time to do anything other than focus on Renko now before we go. So uh, we're gonna take it for a bit of fun on the weekend for a couple of days, a bit of off-road stuff. That'll be a bit of a laugh, a good break, but the rest of the weeks now is gonna be really trying to get all the jobs on Renko done and there's lots of them. All right, well, take care, I'll catch you then. See ya. D squad uh, eager correspondent. B squad. From D squad to B squad. Hello, ladies. You're in the veggie patch. Yeah, me veggie patch is scoundrel. You're in trouble. I'm in. putting the hose on you, you scoundrel. <laughs> Bigger hens lay bigger eggs. Bigger girls have bigger. Is Barker being good to you? Be nice to the chickens, Barker. <laughs> Barker. Barker. They don't want to play your game. <laughs> he just chases the one side to the other.
Top 10.